Mark, chapter 2, verses 13 to 22. And he went forth again by the seaside, and all the multitude resorted unto him, and he taught them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the receipt of custom, and said unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. And it came to pass that, as Jesus sat at meat in his house, many publicans and sinners also sat together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eat with the publicans and sinners, they said unto his disciples, How is it that he eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he saith unto them, They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And the disciples of John, and of the Pharisees, used to fast, and they come and say unto him, Why do the disciples of John and of the Pharisees fast, but thy disciples fast not? And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride-chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come, when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then they shall fast in those days. No man also soweth a piece of new cloth on an old garment, else the new piece that filled it up taketh away from the old, and the rent is made worse. And no man putteth new wine into old bottles, else the new wine doth burst the bottles, and the wine is spilled, and the bottles will be marred. But new wine must be put into new bottles. The person who is called Levi, at the beginning of this passage, is the same person who is called Matthew in the first of the four Gospels. Let us not forget this. It is no less than an apostle and an evangelist whose early history is now before our eyes. We learn from these verses the power of Christ to call men out from the world and make them his disciples. We read that he said to Levi, when, sitting at the receipt of custom, follow me, and at once he arose and followed him. From a publican he became an apostle and a writer of the first book of the New Testament, which is now known all over the world. This is a truth of deep importance. Without a divine call, no one can be saved. We are all so sunk in sin and so wedded to the world that we should never turn to God and seek salvation unless he first called us by his grace. God must speak to our hearts by his Spirit before we shall ever speak to him. Those who are sons of God, says the seventeenth article, are called according to God's purpose by his Spirit, working in due season. Now how blessed is the thought that this calling of sinners is committed to so gracious a Savior as Christ. When the Lord Jesus calls a sinner to be his servant, he acts as a sovereign, but he acts with infinite mercy. He often chooses those who seem most unlikely to do his will and furthest off from his kingdom. He draws them to himself with almighty power, breaks the chains of old habits and customs, and makes them new creatures. As the lodestone attracts the iron, and the south wind softens the frozen ground, so does Christ's calling draw sinners out from the world and melt the hardest heart. The voice of the Lord is mighty in operation. Blessed are they who, when they hear it, harden not their hearts. We ought never to despair entirely for any one's salvation when we read this passage of Scripture. He who called Levi still lives and still works. The age of miracles is not yet past. The love of money is a powerful principle, but the call of Christ is more powerful. Let us not despair even about those who sit at the receipt of custom and enjoy abundance of this world's good things. The voice which said to Levi, Follow me, may yet reach their hearts. We may yet see them arise and take up their cross and follow Christ. Let us hope continually and pray for others. Who can tell what God may be going to do for anyone around us? No one is too bad for Christ to call. Let us pray for all. We learn, for another thing, from these verses, that one of Christ's principal offices is that of a physician. The scribes and Pharisees found fault with him for eating and drinking with publicans and sinners, but when Jesus heard it, he said unto them, They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. The Lord Jesus did not come into the world, as some suppose, to be nothing more than a lawgiver, a king, a teacher, and an example. Had this been all the purpose of his coming, there would have been small comfort for man. Diet tables and rules of living are all very well for the convalescent, but not suitable to the man laboring under a mortal disease. 
A teacher and an example might be sufficient for an unfallen being like Adam in the Garden of Eden. But fallen sinners like ourselves want healing first, before we can value rules. The Lord Jesus came into the world to be a physician as well as a teacher. He knew the necessities of human nature. He saw us all sick of mortal disease, stricken with the plague of sin, and dying daily. He pitied us, and came down to bring divine medicine for our relief. He came to give health and cure to the dying, to heal the broken-hearted, and to offer strength to the weak. No sin-sick soul is too far gone for him. It is his glory to heal and restore to life the most desperate cases. For unfailing skill, for unwearied tenderness, for long experience of a man's spiritual ailments, the great physician of souls stands alone. There is none like him. But what do we know ourselves of this special office of Christ? Have we ever felt our spiritual sickness and applied to him for relief? We are never right in the sight of God until we do. We know nothing aright in religion, if we think the sense of sin should keep us back from Christ. To feel our sins, and know our sickness, is the beginning of real Christianity. To be sensible of our corruption, and abhor our own transgressions, is the first symptom of spiritual health. Happy indeed are they who have found out their soul's disease. Let them know that Christ is the very physician they require, and let them apply to him without delay. We learn, in the last place, from these verses, that in religion it is worse than useless to attempt to mix things which essentially differ. No man, he tells the Pharisees, soweth a piece of new cloth on an old garment. No man putteth new wine into old bottles. These words, we must of course see, were a parable. They were spoken with a special reference to the question which the Pharisees had just raised. Why do the disciples of John fast, but thy disciples fast not? Our Lord's reply evidently means that to enforce fasting among his disciples would be inexpedient and unseasonable. His little flock was as yet young in grace and weak in faith, knowledge, and experience. They must be led on softly and not burdened at this early stage with requirements which they were not able to bear. Fasting, moreover, might be suitable to the disciples of him who was only the bridegroom's friend, who lived in the wilderness, preached the baptism of repentance, was clothed in camel's hair, and ate locusts and wild honey. But fasting was not equally suitable to the disciples of him who was the bridegroom himself, brought glad tidings to sinners, and came living like other men. In short, to require fasting of his disciples at present would be putting new wine into old bottles. It would be trying to mingle and amalgamate things that essentially differed. The principle laid down in these little parables is one of great importance. It is a kind of proverbial saying, and admits to a wide application. Forgetfulness of it has frequently done great harm to the church. The evils that have arisen from trying to sew the new patch on the old garment, and put the new wine into old bottles, have neither been few nor small. How was it with the Galatian church? It is recorded in Paul's epistle. Men wished in that church to reconcile Judaism with Christianity, and to circumcise as well as baptize. They endeavored to keep alive the law of ceremonies and ordinances, and to place it side by side with the gospel of Christ. In fact, they would fain have put the new wine into old bottles, and in so doing they greatly erred. How was it with the early Christian church, after the apostles were dead? We have it recorded in the pages of church history. Some tried to make the gospel more acceptable by mingling it with Platonic philosophy. Some labored to recommend it to the heathen by borrowing forms, processions, and vestments, from the temples of heathen gods. In short, they sowed the new patch on the old garment, and in so doing they scattered broadcast the seeds of enormous evil. They paved the way for the whole Romish apostasy. How is it with many professing Christians in the present day? We have only to look around us and see. There are thousands who are trying to reconcile the service of Christ and the service of the world, to have the name of Christian and yet live the life of the ungodly to keep in with the servants of pleasure and sin, and yet be the followers of the crucified Jesus at the same time. In a word, they are trying to enjoy the new wine, and yet cling to the old bottles. They will find one day that they have attempted that which cannot be done. Let us leave the passage in a spirit of serious self-inquiry. It is one that ought to raise great searchings of heart in the present day. Have we never read what the Scripture says? 
No man can serve two masters. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Let us place side by side with these texts the concluding words of our Lord in this passage. New wine must be put into new bottles. Footnote. It must always be remembered that the bottle, here spoken of, was not a bottle of glass or earthenware, but of leather. Unless this is kept in view, the parable is unintelligible to an English mind. A similar remark applies to David's words, I am become like a bottle in the smoke. Psalm 119, verse 83. And footnote. 